the clues in the name, you know, the British Broadcasting Corporation. It's, it's definitely, it is a British unionist institution. It's Britishness which is the norm and it's Scottishness which is the aberration for the BBC. You've got to work hard to, to believe the BBC after Jimmy Savile. You must, you must have to put effort in to think that there's any truth behind these guys after the referendum, after Savile. How much more evidence do you need? We'd like to say that, in our opinion, it is not suitable for children or for those of you who may have a nervous disposition. Um, you're publishing this film, Mr. Salmond, uh, on the referendum, but really no prospect of anything happening in this parliament. You've just heard a, a great tidal wave of malaise um, from the people our reporters spoke to. I mean, the fight's gone out of this, hasn't it, really? Wow. <laughs> the usual impartiality of the British brainwashing corporation at its best. Today, there have been further warnings about the possible negative consequences of Scottish independence. Deutsche Bank said a yes vote would be comparable to the mistakes that led to the Great Depression of the 1930s. Uh, this afternoon, there have been protests outside uh, the BBC's new headquarters in Glasgow uh, against uh, alleged pro union bias by uh, the corporation. No, 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 no. I'm going to give you uh, just a, a little rundown of some BBC headlines, okay? Now you can look these up on the BBC website. These are all actual headlines, and I think you'll see a theme coming through. Scottish independence. Pension shortfall warning. I became quite startled by just how biased the coverage was, probably about 18 months out. And I started to actually research it. And I found, I think, 18 examples of a BBC headline uh, which combined the words independence and warning. And plainly that doesn't happen by accident. Scottish independence, warning over weakened military. Scottish independence, Luxembourg warns against. <laughs> the government of Luxembourg has warned against Scotland becoming an independent country. The country's foreign minister, Jean Asselborn, says that the current economic crisis in Europe spells a time for solidarity. The idea that um, Luxembourg, which is a much smaller country than Scotland, is actually extremely economically successful despite having almost no natural resources, unlike Scotland. Uh, the idea that Luxembourg uh, was in a position to uh, denigrate Scotland should make the lead headline on the BBC uh, is just astonishing. Well, Luxembourg is one of the world's most successful small countries, but clearly its foreign minister, Jean Asselborn, doesn't want Scotland to pursue independence. At and in time. fact, the Luxembourg government intervened to clarify that the BBC had misreported their foreign minister and that wasn't what he'd said at all. I had no clue about anything political, never been like that, didn't watch the news, went to work, came home, dealt with kids, didn't know anything and the next thing I'm hearing that there's to be a, a referendum on Scottish independence. I'm honoured to announce that on Thursday the 18th of September 2014, we will hold Scotland's referendum. That was a shock to me. I had no clue. I've never been politically aware. 
So I was neither a yes or a no at that stage, but I was very interested because it obviously seemed like a big deal to me. Well, somebody says you get your information on Scottish independence at Better Together. I went from Better Together to I start seeing people posting some real Scottish history, th things that I can verify but weren't what I was taught. At that stage, I had no idea of Scotland's real history. I had no idea that we had been manipulated at all. So then I start seeing that there's another side, there's the yes side, right? But because I've been here first and then I've been here and then I've been there, I'm like, well, who do you believe? So you end up, your study becomes more intense. And that's how I ended up coming to the belief that I was going to be a very, very ardent yeser. When I was a boy, I, I really enjoyed Monty Python. So I had the, my first impressions of the BBC or thing in my mind was was, uh, was a Monty Python, which obviously is very funny and very, uh, and, you know, uh, could, would convey a good image of, of, a, of a corporation that's willing to allow creative talent to flourish. And throughout, I guess, over the 70s and 80s, when I was a boy growing up in the United States, I had this kind of distant idea of the, of the, of the BBC, you know, with, the, with a very posh English accent. There'll be further comment on the budget in the evening news at 5.40. But the image that was conveyed of, you know, this excellent quality, uh, you know, very good programming. So by my logic, oh, well, their news must be very good too, or, you know, of, of, of uh, impeccable integrity, of uh, complete even-handedness in dealing with all situations because after all they're a public service and they couldn't possibly violate their uh, the royal charter which which, which uh, uh, mandates that they be objective uh, but the little did I realize the treatment of Alex Salmond was, was classic propaganda of the kind which um, you know, mainstream politicians may feel isn't propaganda. They may think it's, it's the nature of the dirty game of politics. If you can find the weakness in your opponents, especially if you can find an individual that's unappealing in some way or divisive. With Alex Salmond, I think the, the BBC and, and I have to say it was STV at that time as well, were both prone in any, in any event which related to independence to link it immediately to Alex Salmond. I think part of that was unconscious. Part of it may have been this idea of news values. Alex Salmond is divisive, people want to see him, that kind of thing. But regardless of its, its origin in, in their brains, the consequence was, was the, the, the kind of demonization of Alex Salmond, and by consequence, the damage to the, the Yes campaign. Is there something about the way that you're leading this campaign that potential voters for the Yes side are finding off-putting? Who do you... Believe. Do you believe Alex Salmond or do you believe the Treasury? Damaging headlines for the First Minister. Alex Salmond's credibility is being called into question by opponents. They accuse him of misleading the public about whether an independent Scotland would remain in the EU. Alex Salmond under pressure over independence. The Yes campaign started to become, in media terms, Alex Salmond's campaign. I think it's part of a wider, better together strategy to undermine the honesty and integrity of the First Minister. So if you didn't like Alex Salmond, and I heard people in the street say this, I quite, I quite like the idea of independence, but I can't stand that Alex Salmond didn't say it. They tore after Alex Salmond, like demonised him, villainised him, and you know, I think at times it was really, really personal. Fear not. While Moses, sorry, Alex Salmon, Moses, Alex Salmon didn't quite promise a land flowing with milk and honey, he did claim it would be a beacon of what he called progressiveness. You say that an independent Scotland would be a beacon of progressiveness. Mm -hmm. I think I recall Robert Mugabe saying something similar about Zimbabwe. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think, Jeremy, you can do yourself any great favours by comparing Scotland to Zimbabwe. No, I'm or, comparing or you to Mugabe. Or, or, you to Mugabe. Alistair Darling clearly, easily demonised, I would think, with those eyebrows, you know, easily demonised, but they never demonised Alistair Darling. They only did it with Alex Summers. So it was a very clear, um, I think, quantitatively demonstrated piece of bias.
Once heralded as a beacon of impartial reporting, Britain's main broadcaster, the BBC, is now being accused of being too pro-government in its reports. Coverage on other thorny topics like Scottish independence has been heavily criticised too, with doubts recently cast over the impartiality of senior correspondents. These BBC training videos posted on YouTube show its reporters attacking Scotland's pro-independence stance. You see other people and how upset they are and it's so tangible. And then you start thinking, well, why is nobody doing anything? How do they just get away with us? So you look for protests and then you don't find any. OK, can't find one. Totally frustrated. Make an event. <laughs> BBC bias protest, and I learned from there. I remember doing Google searches of Scottish independence and just seeing rows and rows of, of, of search results of risk, Alex Salmon, uh, damage, uh, all of these negative words and just article after article. And what I, what I constantly saw in the way that the system works is you have these sham corporate funded think tanks, you know, the uh, Institute for Fiscal Studies, Office of Budget Responsibility, and the civil service, of course. So what they would do is produce these reports which purportedly showed the huge risks of independence. This is a, an independent report. These reports would be given to the press, circulated through the BBC, all of the newspapers just over and over again, you know, 10 trillion pound black hole if Scotland becomes independent, their finances will be destroyed. This is a, an independent report. In the run-up to the, the referendum, one of the so-called independent groups was the Office for Budget Responsibilities. It's a significant blow to Scotland's Yes campaign. The Office for Budget Responsibility, the government's official independent forecaster, has revised down its expectations of the likely long-term revenues from North Sea Oil. The Office for Budget Responsibilities was created out of the Treasury by George Osborne. It's populated with people with a neoliberal view of economics. The idea that it's independent is, is, is farcical. It's a significant blow to Scotland's Yes campaign. But it was constantly, by both channels, uh, treated as if it were truly independent and could be described as such. Institute for Fiscal Studies, similarly. This is a, an independent report. All of these um, predictions about, do, these doom and gloom predictions about Scotland completely ignored what state could actually be created. Maybe these things could be avoided if the state was created and, and constructed properly. Maybe these, maybe all of these doom and gloom scare stories are just are just big fat lies. The IFS is a very respected institution. Well, I think one of the things that was very noticeable during the campaign was the amount of time and publicity given to blatant astroturfing. What is astroturf? It's a perversion of grassroots, as in fake grassroots. Astroturf is when political, corporate, or other special interests disguise themselves and publish blogs, start Facebook and Twitter accounts, publish ads, letters to the editor, or simply post comments online to try to fool you into thinking an independent or grassroots movement is speaking. And that's what the Vote No Borders campaign was. BBC News has learned of an alternative no campaign which calls itself No Borders. BBC News put out a five or six minute piece about a new grassroots no campaign organization called Vote No Borders. Gavin Essler has this exclusive report. It was started by Gavin Essler, who's one of the BBC's star performers, who does not normally front pre-recorded news segments. It's still a very dubious setup, the entire thing. Very, very dubious. The idea is a grassroots campaign to rival that of the pro-independence Yes campaign. Exclusive report. And the piece had very high production values. Um, and it had background music. It was like nothing you would normally see on, on the BBC News. For a grassroots no campaign movement, the extraordinary thing was nobody had ever seen it. You know, who, who were they? Where, where had it come from? I did some, some digging and I discovered that Vote No Borders was registered uh, to the London office of a public relations firm named Akanchi that that London public relations firm specialised in what it called national branding. It's 
job as a PR company uh, was to improve the image of national governments. It received money from the Department for International Development for promoting the image of British colonies abroad. And most controversially, uh, Akanchi was paid by the government of Israel to rebrand the image of Israel as a country of achievement. And a little more searching discovered uh, that in 2012, the young lady who worked at Akanchi had put on her LinkedIn page that she was already working on a campaign against the SNP. Now that LinkedIn page was deleted the day they launched the No Borders campaign. The head of Vote No Borders uh, was a gentleman called Malcolm Offord, who is also the director of Akanchi. And Mr Offord is a contributor to the Conservative Party who had donated £120,000 and had, in addition donated money to the personal election expenses of Michael Gove. And Mr Offord was talking about Vote No Borders and saying it was a grassroots movement of ordinary Scottish citizens who had risen up to defend the union. Non-political, not affiliated to Better Together, a grassroots people campaign to allow voices to be heard from ordinary people who want to put their hand up and say, do you know what, I don't want to leave the union, it works for me. In fact, I quite like it, it's like a cup of hot chocolate and I want to keep it. And it got a huge amount of publicity in the BBC. I seem to recall actually it was actually the lead story in Reporting Scotland. It was shown on the BBC 24 news channel every 30 minutes over a 24 hour period. It wasn't just on the BBC dedicated news channel, it was on every single BBC news bulletin, both UK and Scotland, all day. The Yes campaign was defined by grassroots movements. There was a huge amount of grassroots activity and it never got a tiny fraction of the same coverage. So here you have a PR company which is paid by governments and is in receipt of money from the UK government which is producing this so-called campaigning organisation. Non-political. Which did not in fact exist. It actually had no members and no branches. And Gavin Esler, who is as capable of using Google as I am, did not ask Mr Offord whether Vote No Borders was not related to the PR company Akanchi, with which it shared an office uh, in London and of which Mr Offord was chief executive. He did not ask Mr Offord how many members and how many branches does Vote No Borders actually have. In, in, instead, he just asked him simple patball questions to enable him to portray this totally false vision of this new grassroots campaigning movement. That is just absolutely appalling journalism. It's not journalism, it's a peddling of state propaganda. You have this British state and Israeli state-funded organisation putting out pro-unionist propaganda which is made for, made and paid for, by the BBC and then pumped out absolutely all day, again and again and again. Non-political. And then with the timing of that to coincide with the launching of a very expensive cinema ad campaign, it really was quite shameless by the BBC. Have you heard the one about the Englishman, the Welshman and the Scot? No. <laughs> They're in this bar in Rio and they get their passports nicked. Oh aye. And what happens? The Englishman and the Welshman go to the British Embassy and get home. <laughs> and the Scot? He's still there. That's not funny. I never said it was. Separation. It's no joke. And the fact that the BBC had done this huge uh, promotion for an organisation which, in the event, proved not to exist at all, there was never any comeback for that. Is that not astonishing? We've been warned. We've been warned over and over, and we're clearly not listening. We've been warned about our pensions, we've been warned about the European Union, we've been warned about forces of darkness, we've been warned about just about everything. And aliens! <laughs> How can a country of this size defend itself against aliens? Well, 
I attended three out of the, the, the demonstrations outside uh, BBC headquarters in Pacific Key, including the very large one. People always volunteered their talent, their, their expertise, and, and getting them together just, you know, they, they didn't have to be big fancy things. All it had to be was a wee bit of entertainment, and we got our protesting done. And, and what was good about that as well was because because we were able to keep people entertained and things like that, we were able to make them family events and say, bring your children, bring your dogs, <laughs> kind of, let's just go and protest the right way, eh? go there and have our say. I thought the atmosphere was wonderful. It had a carnival atmosphere, I think, even the biggest one. And that, the, the, there were smaller ones. The biggest one, five to 10,000 people, big march right through Glasgow. These are ordinary people, family people, people with jobs and, you know, and, and that, are, that are really, really caring what's happening uh, happening to their country and what's happening with this BBC and, and they want to be there and have their say. BBC, the coverage was very minimal on Reporting Scotland. I think, you know, journalists, even the best journalists, even the nicest journalists, really don't like criticism. They tend to think, you know, we're journalists, we're doing our job here and you just have to listen to us. And so I think they found it a bit unnerving. They hadn't experienced it before. I actually remember watching a, a, a protest outside the Scottish Parliament, um, people who were carers, and there was about 20 people there, and I think they must have got a good few minutes of coverage and they told the, sto the, the full story why they were there. Um, yet you can have thousands outside the BBC and get 19 seconds. So there you are. What does that tell you? Another instance where I felt the BBC and again the Scottish media in general wasn't doing even the most basic research was were the claims that were being made about Scottish membership of NATO. I mean, personally, I'm opposed to NATO membership. I don't want Scotland to be a member of NATO. But the claim was being made that Scotland wouldn't be allowed to be a member of NATO because Scotland would reject hosting nuclear missiles on its territory. NATO has suggested that if Scotland becomes a new state, it would not be a member of the military alliance and would have to apply to join. This former US ambassador to NATO says for Scotland to seek non-nuclear membership of the alliance would be a cause for concern. The SNP's idea that there'll be some quick fix and an independent Scotland could just rejoin NATO without any difficulties is fanciful. And that claim is nonsense. Spain used to host an American naval base, there's still an American naval base there, in Rota, near Cadiz, in the south of Spain. And it used to be a base for Polaris submarines and missiles. It became established in the 1950s when the dictator Franco was trying to worm his way back into the affections of America after having been a supporter of Hitler during the war. He allowed the Americans to host a nuclear base in Spanish territory. It was massively, massively unpopular in Spain, particularly after an incident in the 1960s when a plane carrying nuclear warheads crashed on its approach to the base. The B-52 and the KC-135 were refueling and they uh, crashed. And there were four bombs aboard the B-52. Because of the amount of wreckage that was strewn over such a large area and the fact that there were nuclear weapons involved, we knew it was going to be a large-scale operation. When Franco died, there was massive pressure on the, the transitional Spanish government to get rid of these nuclear submarines. And they negotiated with the Americans to get rid of the, the nuclear subs, to get rid of the nuclear missiles. And then Spain went on to join NATO. The BBC never mentioned it. It was mentioned in my blog, it was mentioned on Usenet, it was mentioned in various other places. It was never, ever picked up. You don't have any excuses for not knowing that. You don't have any excuses for not reporting that, unless you don't want to report it. The BBC should just focus on comedies and nature shows. <laughs> <laughs> don't even try to do the news. <laughs> you know, it, it's absurd. The, the bias is, is insane. The BBC is a mouthpiece for goddamn Westminster. I, I've said already that I think a lot of bias can be semi-conscious and unconscious but to deliberately cut a piece of film to make a point so as to suggest that someone is, 
is expressed an opinion about something that came before and they weren't, as happened in the case of, of Salmond. But I express my regret to Parliament that in retrospect, I clearly did not get all of those judgments correct. So, regrets, but too few to mention for the SNP's critics. Look me in the eye at the back of this parliamentary chamber and explain why local income tax is being dropped. As always, Mr Salmon didn't give the truth that day either. So, presiding officer, was that deceit or incompetence? Fact in the budget to be... Is, is the worst form, in some ways the worst form of propaganda, you might argue, because it has to be deliberate. It's only in a, an ethical sense the worst, of course, because actually propaganda which is invisible, which shows no sign of interference, is by far the most effective. Croatia's ambassador to the UK has warned that trying to impose terms could slow down an independent Scotland's bid to become a member of the EU. Croatia became the 28th member of the club in July. One of the worst examples uh, of deliberate manipulation of data to create an effect which was damaging to the S yes campaign was when Gary Robertson referred to the Croatian ambassador as if the Croatian ambassador had been sending a warning to Scotland, when in actual fact the Croatian ambassador was only talking about Croatia. So you really don't negotiate much because you are just saying to them, okay, we can do it in this time frame or not, and what are the, um, the consequences of this? So you want to have a balance between how much you want to opt out or prolong and what you can take right away. Because if you uh, decide to prolong many things or ask for exceptions on many issues, you are not ready, actually. But there is another issue here as well. No harm to any Croatians, but Croatia has just emerged from a brutal genocidal war. It has no long history of stable institutions. Then to compare Scotland with a Balkan nation is, is, really, is really crazy, it's ridiculous. And no harm to those Balkan nations. I wish them well in the future, but they're not like Scotland. Um, I mean, I'm one of the better together volunteers. I've done my bit uh, uh, delivering papers and, uh, uh, and leaflets. Why, why did you feel you had to be here today? Me? Stop them from going independence. It's part of my religion, isn't it? You know what I mean? It's our country. You know what I mean? You shouldn't be going independence. You're Alex Salmon today. Mr. Salmon, you will not con the loyal Protestant people of Scotland. No to independence and no surrender to separatism. Scotland is treated by Westminster like mushrooms. Okay, they keep them in the dark and they feed them poop, to, to use a TV-friendly phrase. And it's worked, you know, well for Westminster. They get a play on the oil without any having to give anything back. Remember, an independent Scotland would be competing with England. Their credit rating would be higher because they have more assets than England, so they would get lower cost of funding, uh, cheaper interest rates. They'd have a higher rating by the various uh, rating agencies. And the UK doesn't want that competition. Ironically, if Scotland was independent, it would be great for England because then you'd have two competitive countries rallying to each other's uh, competitive uh, potential and you'd have a great economic boom. But now that you have this dead wood stump that's still attached to the rump of England, it's, you won't see that. You expect a national broadcaster to hold politicians to account and to scrutinise the claims that they make. But what was very evident during the, the referendum campaign was that one side was being subjected to considerably more scrutiny than the other. And an awful lot of the claims made by the No campaign were really being allowed just to stand without any scrutiny at all, particularly claims about the European Union. There was the automatic supposition that if Scotland voted for uh, independence, that they would be outside of the EU. José Manuel Dural Barroso is a Portuguese politician who is the president of the European Commission. Before the referendum, Newsnet reported that the Spanish Partido Popular was attempting to form an alliance of anti-independence European parties in the European Parliament, and Barroso's party is associated with that grouping. Now, as I understand the situation, an independent Scotland would have to reapply for membership 
of the EU. The second question is, would it be welcome? I don't want to interfere, I repeat, no. on the, your referendum here and your discussion, the democratic discussion here, but of course it will be uh, extremely difficult to get the approval of all the other member states. They never ever examined Barroso's political affiliations within the European Parliament and why he would be saying the things that he did. They also never reported on contrary statements that were made by other politicians within the European Parliament, which were saying basically that Barroso was overstepping the mark. Well, more than anything else, I think it's important to remain neutral in this debate. And I don't think it was up to President Barroso to uh, say what he thinks about it. The way that the BBC was pushing this so hard uh, uh, with regard to Europe, they had Barroso on there. He said, oh, no, it's, um, you know, it'll be impossible for them to... Uh, to, 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 to stay within the EU, even though he had absolutely no authority whatsoever to make that assertion. He apparently wants to be the next General Secretary of NATO. In order to uh, become that, he needs the support of the United Kingdom and David Cameron. So clearly he did that for reasons that, are, that probably aren't as legitimate as they appear. And so I believe it's going to be uh, extremely difficult, if not impossible, um, a new member state coming out of one of our countries, and getting the agreement of, of the other. The country. interview between um, Andrew Marr and, and Manuel Barroso was again another fine example of, of deliberate manipulation here. That Mar Barroso had clearly been caught at and advised that if he wanted, for example, to become head of NATO, he might need our support, he'd give him support. He was clearly a patsy in all of this. The absolute inability of the of the um, of the BBC to to, uh, to present counterexamples. Well, maybe. Well, wait. Can you really exclude 5.5 million people from the EU just like that? What does it mean to not be in the EU? Oh, they apply, they, the apply the the treaties don't apply. Scotland's already living by these treaties because they're in the UK, which is in the EU. What's the problem? Scotland is a developed European country with huge resources, which already complies with European legislation. And we'll be selling oil, gas, and renewable energy to the rest of the continent. Think about that. And whiskey. Slangy bar. Barroso said Scotland wouldn't be allowed to be a member of the European Union. Uh, when he, he seemed to be kind of prompted in that by Andrew Marr, who went on to agree with him. I think it'll be quite hard to get back in, I have to say, but let's move on. Which was a shocking thing for a, a BBC reporter to do. They're not supposed to give their opinions, but Marr definitely did that. But let's move on. Can I just yes, uh, examine that for a second, Andrew? Uh, this, this is what the Andrew Marr analysis, as opposed having, to having, David having, Edwards, having as talked opposed to, Mr. to former having talked to Mr. Barroso, of which I... as, as opposed, Andrew, to the weight of evidence that's being presented to the Scottish Parliament's committees at the present moment. I don't know, is that an individual expression? Or is that the no, it's not. I've, I've, got, I've got no, I've got no views on this, nor does the BBC. Here. As, got, as what, no views on this, nor does the BBC. Uh, I was simply well, reflecting well, you just, what Mr. Barroso said. What your opinion was? I, 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 I said <laughs> I think it'll be quite difficult having talked to well, Mr. Barroso, I thought, I thought, I, who is, after all, the president. I mean, he Manuel Barroso said pretty much what the UK government wanted him to say. There was no real hard evidence for what he said. There was considerable evidence amongst other European politicians that Scotland will be welcomed. I think the BBC in Scotland is very much, you know, it's very much a child of the Scottish media in general. And the Scottish media in general is overwhelmingly owned and controlled outside Scotland. Because the BBC relied upon the print media for the sources of a lot of its news, then obviously because that's very biased towards the unionist campaign, then the way that that was reported on the BBC was also very, very biased, particularly when they were reporting on the press. Good Morning Scotland is, is a, a very different kettle of fish from Reporting Scotland or, or STV News. Those television news broadcasters are a little constrained. They did, they did have to be quite clever, I thought, at times, to push the unionist agenda. It was more subtle. Good Morning Scotland was astonishing. It was just astonishing. Now, I'm an academic, I, should, I shouldn't be using terms like disgraceful, disgusting, uh, appalling. Its bias was naked. I, I wonder if, they, you know, I wonder if any of them had clothes on in that studio because it, it was incredible, the, the bias, the, the, the repetition, like, like almost, you know, almost Nazi propaganda, 
the, the, the hypnotic repetition of negativity seven, eight times in the show. The front page of the Times, financial turmoil hits Scotland is the headline. They're talking about Lloyds announcing it'll move headquarters to London after a and yes vote. The Daily Record front page of the Herald, the union page. turns it the heat the, on the yes camp, a mountain to claim Mason, they say. who I'm sure you remember from Newsnight, he came out and, and said publicly, uh, thank God uh, I'm out of the BBC. They've gone into maximum propaganda overdrive. Not since the Iraq war has the propaganda been so atrocious. Scotland in the referendum. Scotsman gives its verdict on the choice yes, before us. That we are mortgage lending together could dry up for Scottish home buyers if Scotland votes for independence. Uh, major so lenders. Here's a major guy in the UK media coming out and basically pointing the finger at the BBC as propagandists. Front page of the Telegraph, economic fears, they say put stop to salmon bandwagon. Front page Government of the Daily Mail, uh, now the union strikes back is its yes, headline. Yes, they say that uh, Mr Salmon's economic master plan was being torn apart as deeply by the voters of Scotland's the biggest industries, the industries of the no campaign moving into the lead of the referendum. Yes, 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 this is the British Broadcasting Corporation. This is the British Broadcasting Corporation. Reporting on the referendum was taken over by London, and they came in with a big size tens, knowing absolutely nothing about the delicacies of what they were standing on. You know, so they trod all over it with their, their, their metropolitan prejudices. So you would constantly get just garbage, you know, like, oh, this is about anti-Englishness and stuff like that coming from people who really ought to have known better, frankly. You know, and it was a form of anti-Scottish racism, really. You know, that, that Scottish people require, um, we require the sophisticated metropolitans in order to teach us how to be civilised. There's no real autonomy within BBC Scotland. And you know, in the referendum we saw uh, during the campaign, in the news service in particular, executives and reporters being brought in from London to ensure uh, that the reporting went the way London wanted it. But also, you know, we have to face up to the fact that for decades the Labour Party was the dominant force in Scottish politics. And the Labour Party was extremely focused on getting its own apparatchiks into positions of influence in all state bodies uh, in Scotland, and especially in the BBC. And, you know, you have um, personal allegiances, you have family relationships. The BBC Scottish News Service uh, was essentially an, an adjunct of the Scottish Labour Party for many decades, uh, and nothing has really been done to, to root that out. There are one or two individuals, I'm fairly sure, who are conscious manipulators. These are people with ties to the Labour Party and with visceral hatred, I think, of the, the, the SNP, uh, Alex Salmond in particular, and, and, and a, a deep desire for continuity of a system in which they have thrived. One of the things that does anger me very much about the, the unionists is that the way that they try and make out that Scotland Scottish independent supporters saying that, you know, Scotland should have its own national broadcaster is a completely unreasonable thing to, re to request. When in fact that's the norm. The norm is that self-governing regions and territories have their own broadcasters. Catalonia's got five TV channels. The Basque Country has God knows how many. Galicia has got broadcast channels of its own. They all do, except Scotland. I'm always going on about this. It's a place called Moldova. Uh, the poorest country in Europe, it used to be part of Romania until it was conquered by the Soviet Union at the end of the Second World War. But there's an ethnic minority who live within Moldova called the Gagauzi people. And the Gagauzi people are Orthodox Christian Turkish speakers. Fascinating people with a fascinating history. It's smaller than Ayrshire, uh, it's got fewer people than Aberdeen, but it's completely self-governing. 150,000 people in the poorest corner of the poorest country in Europe have got their own national broadcaster, but Scotland hasn't. And the 
bottom line is that the Unionist parties in Westminster don't want Scotland to have a national broadcaster because that means that Scotland will be capable of having conversations within Scotland about Scotland and that will give us a perspective on Scotland that isn't controlled from Westminster. As far as the BBC ever was independent, I mean, it's always been the voice of the British establishment, but the British establishment has been, in the past, a rather wider and more split uh, body than it is now. It, it is now absolutely focused around a sit series of neocon values that nobody is allowed to question. Uh, so it's not only the survival unionism and the survival of the British state, it's uh, the continuance of trident, <laughs> it's attacking other countries in the Middle East, or, or uh, aggressive foreign policy. Um, it's an austerity agenda uh, when it comes to economics. People who disagree with any of these uh, set tenets of the British establishment are treated by the BBC as idiots or fools. What was very blatant was that they treated the referendum debate as a party political thing. So you would have one member from the SNP and three unionists. So of course that was balanced, it had to be balanced, that's the BBC's version of balance. But balance in a referendum campaign when you know there's, it's a binary choice, it's yes or no, it means giving each side the same say. But that, was, that didn't happen up until the period of Purda, which was just a few days before. And even then, the Purda period was, well, they ran a coach and horses through that with the vow. A new poll for the UK Sunday Times newspaper shows 51% of Scots plan to vote yes. The vow was very much phrased, phrased in a deliberately vague manner because they wanted people in Scotland to think that what was on the table was Devo Max which is what people had been asking for to be on the ballot at the beginning of the referendum in Westminster had said no. Although uh, Labour and Gordon Brown have been the driving force behind this no new sort of Devo Max package, Devo Max package uh, being offered to Scots if they vote no, the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives have clearly indicated they will back it. These proposals are radical and we are putting them forward as a Labour Party. They change not just Scotland but they change Britain. They move us closer or as close to federalism as you can in a country where 85% of it is one nation, England. Gordon Brown was invested with an authority that Gordon Brown doesn't have, didn't have, and the BBC was instrumental in portraying this myth that Gordon Brown was able to deliver things that, frankly, he wasn't. You know, Gordon Brown was, at the time, a backbench opposition MP in a parliament he never bothered attending. The Devo Max pledge, largely developed by Gordon Brown, I think that was, a, again, another clear example of deliberate manipulative propaganda. It was played by the Tories, and Gordon Brown walked straight into that because he has a huge ego, and he allowed himself to be used as a tool, as a muppet, basically. David Cameron had his hand up Gordon Brown like that. And Gordon Brown was quite happy to go along with it, and the BBC was quite happy to, to go along with it too, because he was supporting the status quo, and that's what they wanted to preserve at all costs. OK, let's assume that the, you, you do all come together and you agree these proposals. And then there was the infamous interview on Reporting Scotland with Jackie Burton and Alistair Darling. Let's call them Devo Max, for example. And she was actually feeding them, I thought. A Devo Max, a third option, is something that the coalition in this Better Together group, to which you belong throughout, didn't want. Now it seems you are offering, effectively, the voters a chance to vote yes or for Devo Max. Oh, so this is Devo, Devo Max, Super Devo Max. This is the Devo West Maxiest Devo Max, the, the history of Devo Maxiness and this is the nearest thing to federalism. And it was outrageous, really, the, 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 the way that she led him to make all sorts of claims about what was contained within this vow that were 
not at all substantiated. I think I think Reporting Scotland, <laughs> I think this morning and Jackie Bird presenting did a wonderful job of setting the scene for Gordon Brown to deliver that hammer blow against the against the Yes campaign. The vow was certainly not questioned by Jackie Bird. It was pumped up and it was presented to us as being this is Devo Max. Let's call them Devo Max. I'm aware of demonising Jackie Bird because Jackie Bird's not the, the editor of the or the, the director there. I, I, th I think, to be fair, Jackie Bird is a fair, is a not very powerful figure. But I think Reporting Scotland certainly set the scene for that. And so that, that was collusion at the very least. It was collusion between, I think, the Labour Party and the, the Reporting Scotland elite. In shock, Brits woke up to headlines like these. Don't let me be the last Queen of Scotland. Last stand to keep the union. A new poll for the UK Sunday Times newspaper shows 51% of Scots plan to vote yes. You know, towards the end of the referendum, uh, you know, we, we kind of looked like there was a good chance we were going to get our independence. And then they were just, it was like Alex Salmon said, they threw everything at us. And at that point, we had the arrival of the, all the politicians. All aboard the referendum express as scores of Labour MPs travelled north this morning to try to assist the no campaign. Our imperial masters have arrived. Welcome, our imperial masters. Welcome to Scotland. And we had this push-up in the propaganda. The level of propaganda, in, I did a short report in that period, the level of propaganda went through the roof. Independents could see higher costs of trading being passed on to customers. It will be uh, risks to, to, to businesses. Asda, its boss Andy Clark said if Scotland went independent, its business would become more complex and costs would increase. It would be quite catastrophic economically for Scotland, bordering on the possibility of a depression. The consequences of independence uh, are you know, potentially quite catastrophic. Do you think we, the Labour Party, do you think we would ever stand by and allow the NHS to be privatised or cut in Scotland? Every major Scottish bank would move their registered office to London. If there was a yes vote, it, it would have economic implications. For national institutions, mainly banks, would lose... What, what you had there was perhaps one of the most explicit examples of an establishment panicking and thinking we really have to stop this now. And they did, of course. I mean, they clearly scared people. Uh, enough people, scared enough people to turn them, I think, because I think there was clearly a, a tide for yes, for a narrow yes win. Is actually a vision around which Scotland can unite. The Queen will accept the referendum results, whatever it is. That's her duty as a constitutional monarch. But nobody should be in any doubt. Any breakup of the United Kingdom would be a matter of deep private sadness to her. So it did work. That was effective propaganda, but it was a real hammer blow of propaganda to get that effect. I wrote a piece on it in the blog about it. It was presented to us as a historical documentary. Rory Stewart, the Conservative MP for Penrith. During the referendum campaign, he was given the opportunity by the BBC to make a personal documentary on the borderlands between England and Scotland, in which his argument was that there is no border really, that the people both sides of the border are exactly the same, and historically, the border never had any meaning to the communities either side of the border. Cairn is a traditional structure made in Northern England and Scotland over the last 4,000 years. And it was just complete utter bollocks. It was all about his mad theory that there was this middle land you know, between the, the basically Scotland and England were artificial constructs and they were all really British. And this plainly uh, was an interjection into the referendum campaign disguised as uh, an intellectual, historical account uh, of the border by Rory Stewart. I think the Cairns is a great thing. Um, it symbolises the union. The BBC gave a Conservative MP over an hour to make a documentary saying that the sense of Scottish nationhood wasn't real, that it was a myth, that it was unjustified. I can't imagine during a referendum campaign that the BBC would have given someone on the yes side an equal opportunity to make a documentary about their political theories about the origins of Scottish nationhood, for example, and how it really is a whole lot older than Britishness. Ronnie Stewart is a former MI6 officer. He denies he, he's a former 
MI6 officer. I, I should say that he was uh, working for MI6 in Afghanistan while I was British ambassador in neighboring Uzbekistan. And I actually met him in his capacity as an MI6 officer. I'm um, Stuart's not only ex MI6, he, he was the tutor to Prince Charles's children, to, to, to William and Harry at one stage. And Stuart's father was actually the deputy head of MI6. Uh, so, you know, a deeply, deeply establishment um, family. Where did he get the money from us? Where did that come from? It was funded by the BBC. The BBC spent lots of money on it. And it would be very interesting to know how that came to be commissioned. One of the most dramatic examples of pro propaganda is the, the case with Nick Robinson, where Nick Robinson lies, basically, about Alex Salmond failing to respond. This week, reporters have flown to Edinburgh from all over the world. But Alex Salmond knows that for victory, he needs to reassure voters at home. I kind of was already knowledgeable by the state the time that Nick Robinson came out with us. He didn't answer. And that was the one that um, I showed my fiancé and up until then he was like, you know, you're going on and on about the BBC but really are they? And actually showing him and you're like, well, there's the most obvious sign of it. Thank you very much First Minister Nick Robinson, BBC News. Why should a Scottish voter believe you, a politician, against men who are responsible for billions of pounds of profits. Nick, the uh, corporation tax does not depend on registered... Alex Salmon gave him uh, like a six and a half minute answer in front of all these press. And then it comes on the BBC later on that night and it shows you Nick Robinson asking the question and then says... He didn't answer, but he did attack the reporting of those in what he called the metropolitan media. There's no denying that now. <laughs> It is one of the most blatant, but you have to say, actually, it's probably one of the least effective pieces of propaganda ever, because it went viral and everybody got to laugh at Nick Robinson. It was an attempt, a serious and negative attempt at propaganda, but just blew up in the face of the BBC. Something that I found absolutely stupefying was this notion of a, uh, of a license fee. Now, when I found out that A, it was, you know, 150 pounds a year, and, you know, I live in France and we do pay, uh, we do have to pay uh, a license fee as well of about 100 uh, euros. But when I found out it was a criminal offense, I was like, I, what? Huh? You know, like these little police guys going around or, you know, knocking on your doors, getting you to, to, to you know, like, uh, like a mafia racket, you know, if you don't pay up for there to be this uh, extortion of money to, um, uh, to, um, to fund something that people don't like and, hold in, and many hold in deep, deep contempt, in order to, to force them to pay it, I just, I, I mean, that sounds pretty totalitarian uh, to me. And then realizing that, at least in the context of the Scottish independence referendum, this money was going to London to be used to finance this propaganda to the Scots. So they're using their own, they're, they're taking their money to convince them that they can't be an independent country. It was just absolutely uh, um, bewildering. In, back in the 1980s, and the parliament had a clear idea that they need their own media to explain what Catalonia was about. And that was, had nothing to do with uh, politics, but with culture, with the country, to explain the geography, to explain population, how we lived, etc. And the parliament decided uh, to start having a television, which depends on the parliament, back in 1983 and a radio, public radio station and public television, which uh, were independent from uh, the Spanish uh, political structure. And that's the key thing to the existence of TV3, which uh, is the, our public television station. The money comes from the Catalan budget. So the parliament, the Catalan parliament, uh, which we recovered after Franco's death because of the uh, constitution of 1978, uh, the, the Spanish Constitution of 1978 decided that the Spanish, the Sp Spain was organized in uh, autonomous communities, right? Catalonia being one of them. 
the Basque Country being another one, and Galicia, Andalusia, blah, blah, blah. And uh, our parliament in Catalonia, not the government, our parliament decided that uh, we wanted a television and a radio station, public television and a radio station. So they approved the law the, uh, to, to, to have a, a, their own television, which the Spanish approved, of course, first in the Spanish courts and then at the Catalan parliament. The Spanish government doesn't like very much that TV3 and uh, Catalonia Radio is working so well because we are leading the audience figures, so they, they are not very comfortable with this. But they don't do anything that can be interpreted as if they want us to shut down, right? They regulate very strongly, they, they need us not to have a deficit and they need to put across regulations that make us mm, very difficult in mm, the, the institutional life but uh, they won't do anything to shut us down in, in, because we depend on the Catalan institutions, we don't depend on the Hispanic institutions. So we report to the Catalan parliament, that's a key thing. Basically our sources were uh, on the one hand our correspondents there which are based in London. So the perception of what was going on in Scotland, it was, of course, uh, through London. And on the other hand, and thanks to internet, of course, we got to the main, um, the most important media in the UK. So we're talking about the BBC, we're talking about The Guardian. When we're talking about how uh, the UK is seen abroad, so I'm uh, quite sure that uh, the, the information coming from the British government was uh, somehow uh, overplaced, um, and uh, this is probably why we had uh, this uh, th this idea that uh, the debate that was uh, going on in the UK was uh, very civilized. Uh, at the same time, I have to say that uh, as we were sending our special uh, reporters to to Glasgow, to Edinburgh, uh, to everywhere in the in Scotland, how things were a bit different. For example, we had the sensation, we had the feeling that uh, uh, the, on the ground, the most popular vote would be for independence. So when you saw the campaign with the meetings really full, you would see that there was a passion for independence. On the other hand, you would see that the campaign for staying in the UK was based purely on lobbies or uh, big organizations or companies that had the interest of keeping the Scotland in, within the, the UK. What has happened in Catalonia is that uh, there was a social movement called uh, National Assembly, Catalan National Assembly, which is very important to understand the, the Catalan movement, apart from the media coverage. With the, the Catalan National Assembly is a social movement that has been uh, growing up very quickly through all the um, country and has been mobilizing everyone who want independence to go to the streets and demonstrate. That's what really took people up to the streets, not the television. The Catalan television and radio did this, explain what was going on. But who mobilized people was the Catalan National Assembly. Now we will see what happened, because now it's a time of politics. And when it comes to institutions, social movements need to, need to give some room to politics, see what they do. But uh, the social movement has been cued, really, 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 to, to this um, independent project. Scotland has voted no in this referendum on independence. last night and hundreds of loyalists charge into George Square. I remember the headline in the BBC was disturbances in George Square between supporters of independence and supporters of the Union. I think it was just portrayed as. So it was given as a kind of, there was a moral equivalence there. 
that it was both sides fighting, when it wasn't. It was fascists who support the union attacking independent supporters. That's what happened. People with pro-independence badges were assaulted. Reporting Scotland were clearly unnerved by the whole thing and were struggling to talk about it. I think they panicked because they saw that very quickly this incident could cast the No campaign in a very negative, very negative, violent light. There, there was no reference, no reference at all to any suggestion that these protesters with the Union Jacks and the Nazi salutes could be connected in any way with the No campaign. The real violence and the independence campaign was entirely from the no side. Yet that's the side which claims victimhood status. I think this is the most creative time that I can remember in Scottish political debate. There are ideas to be what I did see coming out of the referendum, and I think which was one of the most positive aspects of it, uh, was first of all the, the, a great political awakening within Scotland. The Scotland that I saw briefly back in the 1990s and the Scotland that I experienced during the referendum was completely different. Uh, and, part, and obviously part of that awakening is the emergence of new uh, indep independent media, although not on the scale of the BBC, at least, at least yet. Uh, you have, uh, for example, Newsnet Scotland that I wrote for, Wings Over Scotland, uh, Independence Live. Also, there was uh, the uh, Dougie Doug cartoons that were made that were just fantastic creative um, uh, expression over, over the referendum. Uh, and the, uh, obviously, these things were uh, ignored by BBC and the other unionist media. Yes. The great positive of the referendum campaign was the absolute burgeoning of new media and the fact that such a large proportion of the population uh, started getting their news from other places. I was by no means the biggest or most important pro-independence blogger. I was just one of a lot of individual voices, and, and we weren't controlled. You know, we didn't necessarily all agree on everything. It was great. You know, an absolute burgeoning of, of democracy and energy, both on the streets and in the new media. Independence Live covered, you know, neighborhood meetings where there were fantastic speeches. All of the things that were la lacking on the BBC were taking place in town halls and churches and neighborhood meetings all over Scotland. But it wasn't covered. So the, the and, and and so the, the the positive, very compelling cases that I heard during the referendum on Independence Live or other events were completely ignored. The Scottish referendum campaign showed up the BBC in its worst possible light for everyone in Scotland to see. And I think trust in the BBC in Scotland is now extremely low. But it did more than that, of course, because in Scotland people could see that there was a massive gap between what the BBC was reporting and the truth. People then suddenly realised, wow, maybe they're not actually telling us the truth about Israel or Syria or anything else. And so I think the... Um, uh, the scepticism in Scotland about the BBC um, now goes beyond the question of independence. You know, pe people have had the scales fall from their eyes and they realise now that the BBC is simply a state propaganda organisation like the majority of, of state media organisations throughout the world. It's a shock and it's, it's disappointing and you just feel cheated. Eh? It's saddening as well to see, you know, what has happened to Scotland all these years and, you know, the majority of people because the only source of information they ever had was off the trusted BBC had been led away from, from the truth and, and actually making a, a, a real 
judgment on independence as opposed to a manipulated lie. The top people in the BBC mix with top politicians, formerly New Labour. They mix with council leaders, they mix with industrialists. They sometimes send their kids to the same private school in Glasgow. So they become part of a little kind of elite culture, which thinks that their way of thinking is the best way of thinking. And then when they're in positions as editors or senior reporters, they communicate often indirectly these values, which are largely neoliberal values, to the junior reporters. And the junior reporters think, how can I keep my job? And so they write that which will please and so on. They work towards the editor who works towards the director and so on. Then you see Jimmy Savile and he's running about with various members of royalty and MPs and then you're hearing about Dolphin Square and the Elm Guest House and, and you just realise the whole system, the whole system is just riddled and corrupt and the BBC is as much part of that as any of these guys. They're all just tools and weapons for each other. They all support each other and they've all kept themselves safe by getting themselves entangled and working together. And we're the people sitting and we see these things. I come from this background of having you know, worked all around the world on, on, on politics and diplomacy. And I have become sceptical that it's possible to have a state media uh, that isn't a tool for the state, for state propaganda. If Scotland becomes independent, I actually don't want an independent Scotland to have a state broadcaster. I, I think we've, we've got beyond uh, being the kind of state that needs a state broadcaster. In this age of new media and multiple platforms and thousands of channels on TV and radio, uh, a state broadcaster is no longer needed. I think it's a very special time and I think there will be big changes in Scotland. The evolution of the BBC to Scotland, I think, won't really work. I don't, I don't think it's possible for the institution to be one institution and have a devolved section. You know, there's got to be one boss and the boss will be in London. And when things get tough, when the going gets tough, the devolved Scottish BBC won't be independent enough to satisfy the more than 50% of the Scottish population now who despise them. Assuming a new referendum comes about within the next few years or so, I just don't, I, there's no way that the BBC has the credibility to play the same role they did uh, because every, like the Labour Party, they saw what it's, they're all about, really, and, and they're keeping the union together at all costs, even at the expense of self-determination and democracy. The First Minister arrived in Brussels today to a warning from Spain's Prime Minister that he will oppose any attempts to hold talks with Brexit. It actually makes the case for an independent Scotland a bit more complicated. It raises all sorts of new questions about currency and border controls. The BBC is in a total muddle on this. Uh, they have to work out whether they are a public service broadcaster, whether they believe in impartiality and balance or not, and excluding the third largest political party in the UK from a debate in the run-up to the next Westminster election, where we may well hold the balance of power, is a disservice not only to the ethos of the BBC, not just to voters in Scotland. Scotsman's main story, Nicola Sturgeon, is maximising uncertainty and damaging prosperity by, in quotes, touting a second independence referendum. These are the words of the Scottish Secretary, David Mundell. He called on the First Minister to take a firm line with, quotes, fanatics in our party who are... Foreign Office Minister David Livingstone has cast doubts, cast doubts on the possibility of Scotland remaining in.